For some reason that we'll probably never fully understand, an extraordinary outpouring of energy began to occur around the year 1100. It was so powerful and so passionate that it transformed the way the world looked and thought about God, about justice and power, about women, love and art. This story starts with the almost unbelievable life of the woman we will come to know as Eleanor of Aquitaine. Eleanor had virtually everything this life can grant. Sunlit beauty, inherited power and wealth on a phenomenal scale. Kings as husbands, kings as sons. She lived an epic life in the middle of a whirlwind. Entangled with five mightily powerful men, who fought for more than a century to control Western Europe. Surrounding them is an incredible array of people who lived in that world doing incredible things, from building stone cathedrals that streamed with sunlight, to fighting two crusades, to inventing fictional characters we still read about. We know of only a few of them, and what we do know of even these favoured few is limited by their records and our own comprehension. Come with us as we journey to meet Eleanor of Aquitaine, Henry Plantagenet, Richard Lionheart, King John, and all the remarkable people surrounding them. To be in their presence is an exhilarating experience. Won't you join us? Welcome back to Lion's Forge. My name is Beckett, and I want to tell you a story, an epic, true story of five kings and the Lion Queen. Episode 14, Great Damascus While beleaguered King Louis had struggled through the ghastly battle of Mount Cadmos, near bankruptcy in Antioch, and the bitter time with his wife, the Aquitanian heiress Queen Eleanor, his key ally, Conrad of Germany, had enjoyed a rather more pleasant life. After being badly wounded at Dorylaeum, he was taken back to Constantinople, by the Byzantine emperor Manuel Comnenus, where he recovered his health, optimism, and energy amid the delights of the magnificent city, delights which were virtually neutered, some say by Manuel Comnenus himself, warmed hearts on both sides. The German monarch now agreed to join a Byzantine war against the hated Sicilians once his crusade obligations had been fulfilled. He also doubled family ties between the Germans and the Byzantines by directing his younger brother, Duke Henry of Austria, to marry Manuel's niece. In turn, the flatteringly grateful emperor put a fleet of Dramans at Conrad's disposal, the fastest ships in the Byzantine navy thanks to their double ranks of rowers combined with handsome triangular sails. Then. As a final gesture of bon ami, before he waved goodbye to his new friend, Manuel delivered 2,000 blooded Arabian horses, trade goods, and Byzantine gold to the Constantinople docks to be loaded aboard Conrad's new ships. The Byzantines and the Germans were becoming fast friends. Conrad and the army he'd reassembled sailed in early March, 1148. It took them over a month to reach their new base in Acre, a Mediterranean port city so perfectly situated that it had played a role in human history for some 4,000 years. Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, and even the mythic hero Hercules had known Acre, and it now welcomed Conrad and his Germans as they disembarked from a month at sea. Waiting for the French to arrive, Conrad independently came to the conclusion that Edessa and its sister prize of Aleppo, once the core goals of the Second Crusade, were no longer of interest. Of course, the Germans knew the dismal reality that Edessa had essentially ceased to exist, thanks to Nur ad-Din's eviscerating victory. As for going after Aleppo, Passionately wanted by Raymond of Antioch, Eleanor's uncle and rumored lover, that objective took on fresh significance thanks to Conrad's newfound friendship with Manuel Comnenus. 
the Byzantine emperor happened to be Raymond of Antioch's liege lord. It would be awkward for the Germans to help Raymond grab Aleppo while riding Manuel's gorgeous horseflesh and buying supplies with Manuel's money. Conrad instead gravitated toward a completely new plan, first proposed by the leaders of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Use the Crusader army to attack the towering stone walls of nearby Damascus, the oldest of all the age-old cities in the Middle East. People were living civilized lives in Damascus before the pyramids were built. Even today, thousands of years later, the place has weight, still one of the Middle East's greatest cities. Men of the 21st century had fought over it as passionately as men did in the 12th. Muslims of Conrad's day considered Damascus so beautiful as to be a paradise on earth, and they valued it every bit as much for its religious meaning, since it was believed to be the site of the Messiah's anticipated coming on the Day of Judgment. Its walls overlooked the birthplace of Abraham, the place where Cain slew Abel, the graves of some of Muhammad's closest friends. Nor was Christianity slighted in its antiquity etched streets. St. Paul had been on his way to Damascus when he had his famous vision, such a physically and emotionally shattering experience that he had to take time to recover in a Christian house in the city. Damascus had never before been a target for crusaders, but it quickly became compelling, this pivot on which communications between the Islamic powers in Baghdad to the north and Egypt to the south turned. It had once been an ally of Jerusalem's, but it was now allied with the fearsome Nur, and thus a genuine threat to Jerusalem, and everyone knew that Jerusalem had to be protected at all costs. In short, the great city was invaluable to both sides, Muslim and Christian, although perhaps the Europeans feared it as much as they wanted it. The battle for it, when it came, would be ferocious. Just as Christians would fight for Jerusalem, Muslims would fight to hold Damascus. Louis arrived in Acre to rejoin Conrad and a strategic conference was quickly organized at a nearby oasis called Palmyra. An assembly of what's been described as the most important individuals ever to gather in the history of the Latin East met to work out plans for the recombined Western forces. Louis, Conrad, and the 18-year-old king of Jerusalem were there, as was the longtime female power behind the Jerusalem's throne. Queen Mother Melisande. Bishop Otto of Freising, presumably recovered from his ghastly winter in the mountains, arrived. The full array of archbishops and bishops who had traveled with the European armies was present, as was most of the hierarchy of the church east of Constantinople. The flower of French and German crusading aristocracy attended their liege lords. The leaders of the Templars, and the Hospitallers of St. John were there, as were vassals representing subsidiary Outremer states. One can picture the grandeur, if a bit frayed, of this summit conference, the robes and crowns and bishops' mitres, slaves carrying sweating urns of water and wine, platters spilling over with grapes, honeycomb, cherries, bread studded with raisins and sesame seed, roasted lamb. Hundreds of horses wickered and flicked their tails among the palms, while men in belted tunics with broadswords strapped to their waists moved restlessly from tent to tent. Oasis breezes moderated the heat of a Middle Eastern June, setting banners of sky blue, scarlet, indigo, silver, black and gold fluttering from tent poles. Bitter Raymond of Antioch deprived of his chance at Aleppo, was not present. Eleanor is not mentioned. We have no record of who said what, although the chronicler William of Tyre described a debate which ended with the unanimous agreement to attack Great Damascus. 
Edessa might be lost forever. Aleppo had been bypassed. But lovely Damascus, cupped within fruit orchards as much as five miles deep, was right there. Saracen threat wrapped in airy green. If they could take it, even Aleppo might become irrelevant to everyone except Raymond. The entire army of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the French forces, Germans who had not gone back to Europe, and mercenaries hired for the battle would all head out within weeks. It was believed that a mere fifteen days of siege would take it, and taking it might make up for all of the other damaged, lost, and wasted days of this unlucky crusade. The Europeans came at it from the north and the west, moving along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, climbing Mount Lebanon, and then entering the plain of Damascus, where the timeless city nestled among its tens of thousands of fruit trees, irrigated by the silvery-blue waters of the Barada River. The trees were grouped in walled plots built by their respective owners. Some plots were protected by small defensive towers. Paths between the walls were narrow. The crusaders began to shoulder their way along the little paths, slicing down young trees and overhanging branches, clearing defenses that had been hastily thrown together from mud, stones, and wood. The Europeans took casualties, but they could not be stopped by peach trees and Muslim arrows, not even by the furnace-like heat of Syria in late July. By dusk, the Muslims had retreated from the orchards. Things looked very promising for the crusaders as the moon laced together the city's rooftops. The next day, German knights and troops from Jerusalem took the Arabs on in hand-to-hand -hand combat in front of the city's golden walls. The fighting was brutal. Some claim to have seen Conrad decapitate a huge Muslim warrior with one mammoth blow of his sword. This time, at long last, all the European blood, sweat, and pain wasn't lost. For the first time since they had left home, the Crusaders had the chance to defeat the Muslims and take one of the holiest cities in all of Islam, a key ally of Nur ad-Din, the greatest city in the Middle East. Well, it didn't happen. No one understands to this day how the wretched outcome at Damascus was plucked from the open palm of success. Conrad later claimed that locals from the neighborhood arrived telling the Europeans that the city's defenses on the sides facing the orchards, where the crusaders had settled in, were impregnable. Although siege weapons had not even begun to try those allegedly impregnable walls, although scouts had never been sent to reconnoiter, for some inexplicable reason, the crusader army readily gave up its lines and moved to the opposite side, crediting the stories that Damascus's walls were weaker there. Sadly for the army and its leaders' trust in others, Conrad writes that they had been purposefully led astray, directed to a location that bristled with startlingly strong fortifications. There was no water there to offset the suffocating desert temperatures of late July. There was no food for soldiers or horses. Ranks of Arab archers and lancemen rallied from every neighboring Muslim village had silently filled in behind them. It was a given that Nur ad-Din would be coming at them from Aleppo, his army due on the horizon any day. All the while, as their situation deteriorated by the hour, the Europeans spent their time arguing over who would rule Damascus once they took it rather than figuring out a strategy to cope with the sobering reality confronting them. Maybe that sobering reality took hold when one weary French infantryman turned his face to the relentless sun and felt the heart drain out of him. Maybe it started with a rumor of Muslim hordes about to descend from the north. Maybe it started with simple thirst. However it started, once it began, there was no way to stop it. Small groups, and then larger groups, and then entire segments of the massed crusader army simply gave up. Within hours, they were all gone. 
Stragglers killed from behind as they tried to make their way west, 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 west to the safety of Jerusalem. The Second Crusade, begun with such fervor, such intensity, such planning and sacrifice, so many dead in its cause, was over. You cast about for something equivalent in our day, something on the scale of deciding, shortly after the first waves hit the beaches on D-Day, that retaking Europe would really be too much trouble. So let's all go home. The questions were so obvious, anger at the waste and folly so acute, dismay at the failure so profound, that Europe sagged under the weight. Certainly, none of the principals from that glorious assembly at Palmyra shouldered the blame. Those who wrote accounts, beginning with Conrad, searched for proof that they had been betrayed. A favored target was the kingdom of Jerusalem, always perfectly understood to be a stew pot of treachery. Its nasty reputation doubled and redoubled as people gossiped about internal rivalries and Damascene bribes that had easily persuaded the kingdom's nobility, from the queen mother on down, to play turncoat and fingers were inevitably pointed at the absent Raymond of Antioch, believed to be itching for a way to even his personal score with Louis. What really happened still isn't completely known. Muslim resistance certainly stiffened after the fight in the orchards. This was Damascus, and it would be defended as tenaciously as Christians would defend Jerusalem. The Arabs pulled relief forces together on the run, from every one of their strongholds within fifty miles. Crusaders worn from days of marching and fighting would soon face an army of fresh Muslim archers under Nur ad-Din boiling up out of the desert. Most disheartening, the Europeans move around the city's walls, intended to open the door to ready victory, had quickly gone sour. It's one thing to grapple with a bad situation when you know what you're heading into, but something else when an afternoon stroll turns into a mugging. The move around the city was supposed to make things easier. Finding that it hadn't was the final disaster in a series that stretched back to Doralaeum. The Crusaders had finally reached their limit. No one at home would ever understand it. The remembered glory of the First Crusade all the optimistic years of excited preparation for this second, and then nothing but disappointment after sorry disappointment. Edessa, Doralaeum, Mount Cadmos, Otto of Frising and his massacred pilgrims, Antioch's ugly rumors, and now Damascus. The humiliated leaders found it easier to blame treachery than to admit fumbled strategies and sorry collapse. But it didn't matter. The truth could not be sugared. The First Crusade had been a brilliant success. This one, a dreadful failure. Thoughtful chronicler John of Salisbury was convinced that the Crusade's failure had done immense harm to the Christian faith itself. The all-powerful Catholic Church, so deeply involved in a supposedly holy war that had turned into an utter calamity. The mammoth wave of self-doubt that swept Europe even caught up the sardonic troubadour Mercabru, who normally didn't stray too far from the contemplation of the pleasures of lust. He felt compelled to write of the public outcry over the debacle and describe the Crusade's leaders as broken failures. Bernard of Clairvaux himself, who'd recruited the Crusade's armies, wasn't safe. Some openly questioned whether his crusading sermons had really been inspired by God. Contributions to the Cistercians fell, a serious rebuke. Anguished Pope Eugenius considered the outcome the worst injury which the Church of God had suffered in a lifetime. Women wept in empty beds. Men dropped battered armor to rust in the fields. Cripples haunted roadsides for years to come. Children grew up without fathers. 
farms went to weeds and brambles. It was over. One of the mightiest international efforts in all of history simply flickered out and died. We've come to the end of our story for the time being. I am Beckett Arnold, narrating from the book Lion's Forge, adapted for us by the author, Karen Markle Knapp. Thank you to Francis Butt for voicing our introduction. If you like what you hear, please give us a rating, follow our channel, and share us with your friends. Most importantly, please join us again November 27th for the next episode of Lion's Forge, available everywhere you get your favorite podcasts, streaming on YouTube with video episode trailers, and on Facebook, where you can ask questions, leave reviews, and interact with me. Until next time, thank you for listening.